30 years ago, the Rainbow Warrior was crewed by an eclectic group of passionate activists protesting in our Pacific waters. Amongst the crew was Hilary Anderson, the ship cook and musician. Hilary was in her 20s, young, adventurous, open-minded and committed to the environmental cause. Her concern about the impact of French nuclear tests in the Pacific inspired her to join the ship, unaware of the significance Rainbow Warrior would have in New Zealand's story and her own. Since that fateful day in July 1985, Hilary returned to high school teaching and is here 30 years on to reflect with us on this monumental event. Welcome Hilary. Thank you, Phoebe. Now prior to the Rainbow Warrior, I understand that you're working in Greenpeace offices in Paris where the focus was primarily on saving the whales and seals. However, you took interest in the nuclear testing that was happening in the Pacific. What was it about this specific event that resonated with you and motivated you to protest? First, <coughs> it was an invitation that came from uh, from Aotearoa and Elaine Shaw was particularly someone who I always will honour for her commitment to um, nuclear free independent Pacific and the anti-nuclear uh, issues in the Pacific and she sent me a lot of information and I found out a lot and I realised it wasn't easy in, uh, in the Paris office to, to work on that issue but I was asked after I was working in a night shelter for the homeless back in London I received this like commission to please find um, specific things for a campaign and one of them was a big uh, um, a big cut in other words a, a, a for Mororoa at all in other words it was to do with an oceanographic map and the then I was asked to find a particular thesis that was um, in the Sorbon and um, number four and a basement quite very specific title and I knew that that wasn't going to be easy to find and then I was also asked to s find out what the impact was in French hospitals of those who were coming from Tahiti um, with radiation sicknesses and illnesses and uh, this once again was very uh, cloaked in terms of bureaucracy and I found um, even when I went to the library, the university library at the Sorbonne, I asked for a particular titles linked to Moroa and the librarian ripped the cards up in front of my eyes and said, sun exists blue. In other words, this doesn't exist anymore. And I realized then that there was a lot of uh, bureaucracy that was holding information mm -hmm. about um, nuclear testing in the Pacific. And the, uh, at that stage, I hadn't been so aware of the obstacles that I would I would receive. I was lucky in getting hold of the thesis and a particular student and I went in together on a public holiday and he knew the woman and we had this negotiation happening which worked for getting the thesis. I went across the road to photocopy it. This was, you know, photocopying days. And while I was photocopying it, I heard on the on the in French on the radio an announcement about the New Zealand government complaining uh, um, about the French another test in the Pacific at Moroa and so it was like um, synchronicity that while mm. I was photocopying this massive document so that it could be slipped back into the the library um, the, the news was happening from New Zealand about another test so it just reinforced um, my commitment to that point to make to doing what I could and I couldn't do that much because there was such secrecy about who who was in hospitals and where they were mm. and uh, many people tried uh, with various connections with Tahiti and they too did not find it easy to find that information. Mm. So you were very committed to this obviously and you boarded the ship and you were very much a part of the Rainbow Warrior and fast forwarding can I take you back to that fateful night tell mm. me about your experience in the night mm. of the bombing. I would, I'd like to just say one thing to take me way back because I knew the warrior when she was called the Sir William Hardy in Painted Blue. So my job was actually in 78, all of 78. Mm. And because of my deep bond with the ship that year when all of the crew were busy, you know, um, painting and getting supplies in and, and chipping away at, you know, old blue paint to paint it green with the rainbow, while that was happening, that made it even more part of my own home because mm. I lived on the ship while that was happening and helped stock the galley and so by the time I left um, finally said goodbye to the warrior in 1980 when she sailed in to this port 
in Waitemata, it was like my home coming back. Mm. And um, I was so thrilled to, to know that there were people I knew in common, like Martini Gocce, still there. And um, I obviously had already met Bunny and Hank as well. And I met all these crew, and that first day coming in, we sat in a, in a, on, on a boat together and we just talked for hours. And um, Grace Adekan told us all about the experience of what she had been through with all the crew in Rongelap and in Maj taking the so many um, boatloads to Majato and that deeply moved me. Um, the next two days I didn't go down to the warrior, there was more formal things happening but on the day of the July the 10th I had a job to do. Martini, I said, I'm my turn to do deckhand for you. I'm coming down when I got a chip, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do whatever you want. You know, I'm, you, you're the boss, and I'll be your, I'll, I'll be your, your labour. And it was like midterm break, and I turned up, and I began eight o'clock, and I was chipping away, banging hammers in the night air, in the bright um, winter air, and I was quite tired by the end of the day. I was the last person to leave the wharf, the, the deck and joined um, the, the galley and caught up with uh, friends from overseas, Canada, people I hadn't met for a long time. We were having a party and uh, it was a lot of fun. And there was a certain moment when I did see um, a Frenchman and I did run after him to say hello, to, to speak with him. He slipped away, but later we realised, of course, that he was casing the joint and he was the son of a DGSE officer. But mm, that particular day we were very optimistic about the fact that this boat was f was finally doing not just a journey alone but with a whole peace flotilla and the peace flotilla was going to involve uh, many ships and crews and it was a big meeting about safety happened in the hold that evening as part of the preparation for the journey mm. and at a certain point someone asked me for a, a lift I had a little pink Morris minor at that point back to Grey Lynn I said yes I'll drop you off at Carol's house where you were staying and and I went to bed earlier than usual and at 10 to uh, 12 my partner said I've just had a dream and I've seen the warriors mast half uh, half, half half mast and he woke me and I just got the impression of this dream and then uh, within an hour someone was banging at our door and within 20 minutes we, we were back down bound down at the wharf and we were in the police um, headquarters with the wharf police um, doing this awful experience of realizing that something tragic and disastrous had happened to um, the, the, not just to, to the warrior but also to Fernando per Pereira. Mm. Well that must have been devastating. So what are some of the most valuable and memorable moments that you hold on to dearly in regards to the Rainbow Warrior? Uh, the sense of working together. We, especially in those early years, we were all made decisions on board because the Greenpeace officers didn't weren't necessarily, um, they weren't separate, they tended to have the, 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 the directors on board and so we made a lot of decisions on board and a lot of the information or the learning we did about the, about the issues happened while we were also campaigning uh, and um, I also took pride in my work as a cook, I'd been working, I, I could V23 like that and I also was glad that I didn't just bind myself to the galley and then I got a midshipman steering certificate as part of the crew that I did a watch every 24 mm -hmm. hours um, steering into Reykjavik etc. But in terms of the issues um, I still remember um, I remember seeing so, so many whales which I'd never experienced before and especially um, and dolphins and the most um, momentous moment was probably <coughs> the issue of the gem dumping nuclear waste and not on a ship but on rubber boats we turned up and across the horizon and we witnessed the dumping of these um, massive number of, of um, they were like big drums mm. and this was happening with little, like, very young crew wearing radiation buttons and we saw lids come off with the, the, the same um, captain had been doing the same job for, for many years and that was quite shocking to be right there at that mm. moment of seeing the um, being witness to uh, dumping and luckily with that action despite you know some accidents it, it followed through um, with that uh, anti 
um, dumping in, in that part of the world, hopefully. And it's, I haven't followed through on all the information since then, but um, I'm just aware that that was a change that happened from an action in 1978. Mm. So in immediate years following the, uh, this devastating event, how did this personally affect your life? Um, it made me part of the extended Greenpeace family and like we met up last night again for the world premiere fallout I'd like mm. to honor Bronwyn Elsmore's work on that and so um, I've also I'm the godmother to you know Susie Newborn's Martini Gotche and Luke Tutugoro's children I'm I'm a, also part of that um, the ones who had a lot of parties in the 80s mm -hmm. and we used to dance and we used to we, when the crews were going down to the Antarctic we would have parties and we had quite a few I think you've been to one or two haven't you so that was one of our um, pleasures was hosting sometimes and when the crews would come into town we would often in the 1980s have a party at our house and you know it was always fun and we had good DJs lots of dancing Love dancing, mm. very nice. Um, so you speak very fondly of this Greenpeace community and this Greenpeace family. Mm. How do you all commemorate the anniversary of this event? Mm. Um, the f with sorrow and um, with also um, awareness of, of thoughts of Fernando mm. and um, a sense that the resting place now has, is still, uh, is still has life around it with with the um, the um, in Nematori Bay so I um, personally I sometimes I get a bit rushed and I forget oh it was 10th of July yay I'm I mean, but mostly it's my my goddaughter Brenna who always reminds me she's working for Greenpeace now and she's one of the ones who just reminds all of us hey it's the anniversary today and we we always remember because and sometimes in the first years we used to meet together um, the first anniversary we all went down to the warrior and we walked over her and we sat in a circle and we were quite we were very um, still very moved by the fact that she was still there and we weren't sure what was going to happen there was lots of discussion about what should be the eventual resting place of the warrior and it wasn't certain at that time yeah. But most of all, it's that sense of um, community and a remembrance of an act that violated, um, um, you know, the basically violated as an act of terrorism and was murder intended. The new Rainbow Warrior and other Greenpeace uh, ships are still out there fighting for what's mm. right and fighting for these environmental causes. But mm. how do you think activism has changed from back then to now? I think that um, I probably wouldn't get a job if I was to apply now. I would not have the um, right skills in my cooking, yes, mm -hmm. but um, I wouldn't. Uh, I think there's much more specialist training for those who are doing the really big actions, and that they are very brave and they often, often have got these aerial skills to hang off banners and to. And it takes a lot of phys physical bravery to do those that kind of work. Um, I know that w we were um, we were in, to some extent more naive. We were we had deep faith in what we were doing, but we didn't always know where it was going. Mm. And I had no idea that what we were doing would have would become an international organisation of such an, an immense um, influence. And I honour the fact that w I, we began with such in such a small way, mm. and yet there was immense. Um, dedication to the job it took uh, we were all volunteers and we were deeply committed to the work and it's something I'll never forget or and I knew knew it was um, perhaps you know one of the most important jobs I've done mm, absolutely mm. how important do you think it is for today's generation to fight for environmental and human welfare issues it's crucial and that's why 30 years later, the message of the warrior can get passed on to next generations. I'm totally for that. Um, I'd like to honour Claudia Pondelli's film. She also has made, has made some good work to pass on to, to, um, to students who are doing Rainbow Warrior as in their history assignments. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, um, this is even more, the, the times are even more um, challenging. 
I try, I'm trying to do it today, period five, and through drama, and that um, in my classes today, um, one group of students are, are looking at the ancient, the, the, the Maori gods and, and bringing in, uh, lamenting the problems of, of the earth, and, and with Papa Tuanuku calling on the ancient ones, and who should turn up but some kick-ass 20th century mm -hmm. goddesses from, from the Greek mythology. So we're trying to sort of find some solutions in a feminist kind of a way. Um, but it's, it's literally also looking at what the real issue is, is what is happening with global warming, what is mm. happening with climate change, and the impact of that on nature and on human humans' populations. Yeah, and on that note, what do you hope to see in the f uh, next decade in terms of activism for a better world for our uh, society? Well, I came on the bus today. So for starters, I would like to say, get rid of the car. Uh, it's obviously is, is causing immense destruction in terms of eating up road space and cities and polluting and air. So I'm, I'm definitely uh, on, on that one and I literally haven't driven a car since the 1980s. Um, the other issues are, that they're very, very broad, but um, it's the impact as well of seas rising mm. and you know, the islands that, that are under threat, losing their, their food supplies through salinization. There are, it's the, the, the enormous implications of, of global change, of climate change are, are scary to even consider. Mm. So I would like drastic action on that. And if there's any, if you've got any solutions for, for all of us out there, we want them now because it's, it has to start with um, awareness of not consuming so much. And I think, uh, Phoebe, you remember that work we did in, in our stage challenge and the, the message of um, anti-pollution, anti anti-materialism. Anti it's That's important to look after our environment. Mm. Thank you so much for mm. your pearls of wisdom and for coming in and sharing all of these lovely memories with us. And yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vivi. It's been lovely to talk with you.